the word last week. I have heard reports from many of you that he did a wonderful job. Suit up! Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. Awesome. Awesome. I got a chance to hear it. And uh, if you missed it, go to our website www.warsawbc.com and you will be able to find that under the resource tab by clicking on sermons. We are concluding very soon here, not today, but soon, our study of our series called The Way of Wisdom, Understanding God's Will. But let's take a moment and uh, review what we've learned thus far. Because we've learned some important uh, life-changing truths from Scripture on this matter of understanding God's will that, quite frankly, are paradoxical to our own way of thinking. So far, we've learned that the question is, what is God's will according to Scripture? Not, what is God's will for my life? And when we see that, then we can define each and every decision through Scripture instead of wondering, do I take a right turn here or a left turn? Do I go through the drive through or do I get out and go in? Because otherwise, we may be all over the place. Secondly, we learn that God's will is that you are saved. Then we looked at God's will is that you are sanctified. God's will is that you are spirit-filled. God's will is that you be submissive. And today, we're going to come to a hard one. We thought submissive was hard. This one's tougher. Today, we're going to see that God's will is that you suffer. Our text is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. At the Nicene Council, an important church meeting in the 4th century A.D., of the, of the 318 delegates that attended, fewer than 12 of them had never lost an eye or a hand or limp on a leg that was lamed because they had been tortured for their Christian faith. Imagine that, over 318 delegates, no eye or hand, possibly leg, amputated, but definitely limping, because they suffered for the cause of Christ. You know, when we think about suffering, many of us um, would go to things that either we don't like. I had to suffer through, you know, broccoli bites or, or something like that. You know, or, or we go to maybe something that we feel has hurt us. It could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be mental, or even spiritual pain. And what we're talking about, when, when, when we, Melissa and I, were talking about where God was calling us to minister, I came across a church plant that needed a pastor. It was not a full-time position, uh, but I showed it to my wife, and uh, she encouraged me to go ahead and send a resume to them. You see, we both grew up in the tundra of South Bend, Indiana. A uh, few feet from Michigan. It's nothing for lake effect to add anywhere from a few inches to a few feet of snow to what has already fallen in the wintertime in South Bend. And we felt that we had suffered for Jesus long enough in the north. So I sent my resume to that church plant down in the Virgin Islands. <laughs> Obviously, God had other plans for us as he sent us south, but only an hour. But we are not in lake effect country anymore. We're now in ice country, praise Jesus. You know, there's a difference between how we view suffering and what biblical suffering means. In our passage today, when the text talks about suffering, it has two ideas in mind. The first is in verse 12. And it says that we're to suffer, but another way of putting it is we're to be refined by fire. Like gold and silver, we pass through trials in order to be purified in our spiritual lives. That's what it's talking about there. The other use in the passage is the idea uh, that is used when it's talking about enduring <coughs> or bearing what can be very painful. So we look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and we look at verses 
12 through 19, would you stand with me as I read from the letter that Peter sent to the churches? Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for the judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what then will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Our God and our Father, we ask you to bless the preaching and reading of your word, not just here but across this country and the world today as men stand in the pulpit and proclaim your word to your people. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would convict us convince us, and that we would entrust our souls to you, our faithful creator. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, my God, my strength, my redeemer. It is in the matchless, wonderful name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. You may be seated. If uh, you didn't get an outline and would like one, raise your hand or if you need a pen and someone will get that to you. And uh, we're, we're going to have to kind of uh, skip along here pretty quickly this morning because there are five things that we need to understand about how to deal with suffering. Since God wants me to suffer, now what? It's not, it's not really a great thing to think through. How can a loving God want me to suffer? Well, let's, let's, look, let's, let's walk through this passage along with some others. Before we get to the passage, I want you to look maybe across the page or turn one page back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Peter writes, because he's leading up to our passage, he says, For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Okay, so, so keep that in the back of your mind. Go back to chapter 2 and look at starting in verse 20, halfway through, says, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. You know, there is a myth out there. We're going to pretend we're mythbusters this morning. There is a myth out there that says... That when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the rest of your life will be happy, peaceful, and you'll have no trouble. Can someone say, no way? No, no way. You see, the Christian life is like a rose. There are great times. There are times where the beauty of the rose is all we see. But what's on the stem? Thorns. And sometimes those come along as well. And God puts them there on purpose. And a lot of people don't think through that. Why? Because a lot of people don't read the book of Job. Or they don't say, if you suffer trials. They, 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 they pick and choose out of scripture what they want instead of what it says. And so we're going to look at what it says. Now, I just want to clarify, God does not want you to live in the, your entire life suffering. It's not what I'm saying. But he does will that there are times you suffer. So what, what, is, what, is, what is this saying? Look at verse 12 in chapter 4, verse Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. You know, here's, here's the first thing we've got to understand about suffering. We have got to expect it. 
Matter of fact, it should, it, should, it should be the reverse of what this verse is saying. If we are not in a time of suffering, that should surprise us. Uh, one of, one of uh, my great friends and mentors, Dr. Cecil Siegel, stood right here in this pulpit and said, you are either in a storm of life, you have just come out of a storm of life, or you're about ready to go into a storm of life. And unfortunately, the storm comes and we're like, what happened? Things were going great. What, what, why, God? Why? Well, you want to know why? Memorize this verse. Quit being surprised about it. Matter of fact, um, I, I told my wife uh, about a year ago, things were going really well in our family and some things, and I said, I don't know what's coming but something's coming, and it's not good. And many of you know what has happened in our family in the last year. And it wasn't necessarily good. But we were expecting something. Turn to uh, John chapter 15. You know, Jesus never said that this life will be easy. Somehow we get the impression that life is supposed to be all sunshine all the time. In John chapter 15, starting in verse 18, Jesus says this, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Folks, we are in a war zone spiritually. To believe or hope that suffering will not happen to you is naive at best and dangerous at worst. Let me be clear. Satan hates you. You are an image bearer of God, and so he hates you. He hates all of humanity because humanity bears God's image, and he cannot stand that. The, the world hates you. It hates you because you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. You know, the church is supposed to be designed as the mash unit, a bastion of peace. And many of us come in beat up and ready to wash out week after week. Listen to me, O soldier of God. By the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are not alone in this war. Look around you. Seriously, look around you. Look to your left. As you move in your head, look to your left. Look to your right. Look forward. Look backward. You see these other people in here? They are also soldiers of the living God. And they need you to encourage them just as you need them to encourage you. Someone say, I need encouraged today. Do you? Do you really need encouraged today? If you need encouraged, say amen. 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 Your story, you hear it? Your story. You just spoke on your story. And others need the same thing you do. Your story, the light story of God working in your sufferings, has been given to you to use for encouraging others to the glory of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible is very, very clear on this, and it is something that the church neglects to its own peril. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. There's no period there who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, 
so also you are sharers of our comfort. Church, it is time to start encouraging one another. It's time to say, I'm broken. I need some help. That's why I'm here this morning. So we need to expect suffering. Look at verse 13 in our passage, 1 Peter chapter 4. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. What word is listed twice in that verse, church? Rejoice. We've got to rejoice in our sufferings. It's paradoxical. It doesn't sound right. Most of the time when we're suffering, we're like, Oh, poor me. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Oh, man, this is the worst thing ever. Nobody has ever experienced this in all of humanity. I'm the very first one. And it's a spiral downward. Do you know why depression is so rampant in our country? It's because we won't encourage one another. Proverbs says that a smile or bright eyes brings good cheer to the soul. Nice. Solomon's not talking about putting on a fake smile. He's talking about rejoicing. True rejoicing. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be over scripture today because I think it's important that we understand this is what scripture says, not just like we're taking one passage and trying to make it say something. Matthew chapter 5. This is the Beatitudes. Verses 11 and 12, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says these words. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. That's amazing, isn't it? Ah, but it doesn't stop there, does it? It says they're saying this against you because of me. He's not saying you're blessed if somebody just starts making fun of you. Man, those are the dumbest shoes I've ever seen in my life. Praise Jesus! <laughs> you know, that's, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you're living a godly life, and they attack your testimony. You know, Samuel had this kind of depression thing going on when Israel said we want a king. And he's like, God, they're rejecting me. And God said, oh, no, no, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And that's, that's, what, that's what Jesus is saying here. They're acting out on you because you're the physical form, the hands, the feet, the body of Jesus Christ. And when you're living a life that reflects Jesus, the world will attack. You see, the world does not persecute religious people. But it does persecute righteous people. You see, it's the religious people that killed Jesus. They weren't persecuted. The righteousness of Jesus Christ was. You see, God's view of suffering is very different very often than ours. We look for ways to escape suffering, whereas he tells us to look forward to suffering. Say, man, Pastor, this stinks. Yes, it does. But we're not done yet. There's more to it. You see, when we actually get a biblical view of suffering in our heart and in our soul, and we're expecting it, and we're rejoicing in it, then at that point you will be better prepared to be blessed by it. Look at verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. You see, God's word tells us that with a right biblical view of suffering, we can be blessed in the suffering. Times of suffering are times of opportunity to let love and peace and joy that comes only from Jesus Fill us. And when that happens, opportunities for loving witness open as the lost around us wonder at how we can live in perfect peace in the midst of the trials and tribulations we go through. You know, I've never met a child of God who said, Pastor, man, my faith has grown the most when I'm in a good, comfortable, peaceful place in my life. It doesn't happen. It's not the way it happens. On the contrary, many state how much they have grown in both their own faith and in closeness to Jesus through trials and sufferings. This, this 
this has been on my mind for some years now, and, and I've we've talked with I've talked with many of you about this, and I I keep wondering why in my own life and in the life of those that I know, which means every human being I've ever met, why we have to get to the point where we are pressed down by trials and tribulations to the point of our knees, when that's the point when it started, we should have been at. We have to get all the way through to, 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 the, to, the, to the crisis moment, and at that point we go, God, help, instead of expecting it, rejoicing and going, they're suffering, Jesus, here I am, do what you will. Instead, we go the opposite direction, and we cry out, why, God, why? And let me, let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with the question, unless you camp there. If you camp it, why? you'll never get blessed in that particular suffering or trial. God wants us to move past why to, I, I may not ever understand why, Father, and I'm okay with that. But God doesn't always leave us without a why. Look at Psalm 119.71. Psalm 119.71. The sweet psalmist of Israel writes these words. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Say, what? How many of us would just wake up? How many of you woke up this morning and was like, dear Lord, please afflict me today. Bring some sort of suffering and trial and some sort of heartache. I've just been having too good of a life. I need something to go haywire. Anybody? Man. Look at what he says. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Why? So that I may learn your statutes. Suffering draws us to Jesus. But our, our text is very clear in verse 15. You see that not all who suffer are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Much suffering is the punishment or the consequence of sin. If you suffer, it should be because of your union with Jesus, not your union with evil. See, look at this. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer. Well, you know, I, I have murdered anybody recently. Oh, yeah? In, in Matthew, Jesus says, if you hate someone, God sees that the same as he sees murder. Huh. Make sure that none of you suffers as a thief. I haven't stolen anything. Really? About the pencil at work or the paper clip. Well, that's just small. They won't miss it doesn't matter whether they'll miss it. It's about your integrity. Make sure that none of you suffers as an evildoer. Make sure sin is clear in your life. Or as a troublesome meddler. Another way to uh, translate that is as a gossip. As someone who is, who is in someone else's affairs when they have no business. The sin that's mentioned here characterizes a pagan, not a Christian lifestyle. God says a believer who suffers is to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. And when we do, we're to do something with that suffering. Look at verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Suffering for Jesus in this world characterizes the person as a Christian. No, I want to note this. It's not what saves a person. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Putting all of your trust in, in his shed blood on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. But here's the deal, church. How many of us, and please don't, but how many of us can testify to shrinking back when somebody points out that you're a Christian? How many of us can, can testify to, I don't want to stir the pot. I don't want to make waves. How many of us have hidden our Christianity at a point where we knew we sinned, and so did everybody else? Peter writes and says, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. I've told the story many times 
Some of you have heard it about the time when we were up in the Andorondack Mountains and I was woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning and got a chance to go outside and ask those precious people to keep it down who were drunk and high and happened to be a whole group of Jewish people. Not Orthodox, obviously, but Jewish people. And in the process of conversing with them for two hours, one of them stepped up and said, you're a Jesus freak, aren't you? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. <laughs> I have no qualms about that. I, I'm concerned when people come to me and say, Pastor, I can't share Jesus at, at, at work or at school or whatever, because, and then just fill in the blank. It could be I'm scared, I could get fired, which really means the same thing, I'm scared. If anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. I want you to imagine what your workplace, what your community, what the city, what the country would look like if Christians stood up and said, we believe in Jesus. We are people of the book, we are going to be in the book, and we're going to live by the book. And I'm not going to be ashamed about it. Peter is simply saying, live in such a way so if you suffer, you're only suffering because of your devotion to Jesus and not because of your own mistakes. You know, it's an honor and privilege to suffer with Christ and be treated by the world in the same way that it treated Jesus. Paul tells us in Philippians that the fellowship of his sufferings is a gift from God to us. You know, not every believer grows up and is mature to the point where God can trust him with this kind of experience. And so when the privilege of suffering the same way in, in the sufferings of Jesus come to us, we ought to rejoice and glorify God that he has counted us worthy to share in Jesus' sufferings. Because Jesus is with us in the time of suffering. You know, he was with those three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. He was with Joseph in that prison. He was with Daniel in the den of lions. He was with Peter in prison. He was with Paul in the midst of his trials. And he was with John on that island called Patmos. And he's with you right now. He said that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and you can bet your eternity that he will never, ever, ever, ever break that promise. You may not see him, you may not hear him, you may not even feel his presence sometimes, but rest assured, he is right there. Which is why Peter goes on in verse 19 and says, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. In the midst of suffering, when its, when it's troubles are there, when affliction is happening, you can endure it because you can trust God. That. An evangelist told the story of a friend who in a time of business recession lost his job, lost a sizable fortune, lost his beautiful home. To add to this sorrow, his precious wife died. Yet tenaciously, he held on to his faith. It was the only thing he had left. One day when he was out walking in search of employment, he stopped to watch some men who were doing stonework at a large church. One of them was chiseling a triangular piece of rock. And he said, where are you, where are you gonna put that? The workman looked at him and said, do you see that opening? up there near the spire? Well, I'm shaping this stone down here so that it will fit in up there. Changed the entire man's outlook on his situation. Is God testing you? Are you walking through a trial? Are you suffering? He's shaping you down here to fit up there. Verse 19 says that those who are going to suffer according to the will of God, let them entrust their souls to a faithful creator. <laughs> Maybe your version says commit. It is the exact same word used by Jesus on the cross when he said, 
Father, into your hands I commit, I entrust my spirit. If Jesus could place his spirit in the hands of his Father, with full, complete trust and assurance that he is on the throne, and this did not take him by surprise, so can we, and even much more so. See, God uses your trials. He uses your persecutions. He uses your sufferings and the hardships to chisel you and shape you down here. So when we get to glory, we are perfected into the image of what the church, the bride of Christ, is supposed to look like. Many times we have the why question for God. And the world would tell you that for trust and belief, that why question must be answer. Scripture says this, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Amen? And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen? Amen. God then has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. It is in the unknown moment the moment of unanswered questions where your faith will either grow or falter. The faith will realize that all of our why questions ultimately must have the same answer. The answer to the why question is simply this. Why, God, do I have to go through this? Why are you making this happen? What is going on? And the answer is, our loving God in his sovereign wisdom willed it so. His plan is perfect. That's all I know, and that's enough. Is his wisdom, is his sovereignty enough for you? Or do you have to place yourself in the place of God and have all the answers? It is in suffering that you will either grow or falter. And I stand here before you today that in my life and in many of yours, you could say the same thing. Both have happened to me. I've grown in suffering. I have faltered in suffering. But it's not about the past. It's about what are you going to do right now, right here, to make a decision going forward. As we come in just a moment to our invitation, I want to simply ask you this question. In times of suffering, are you going to grow? Are you going to falter? You may not know what to do with that question. I believe that the only godly response to that question is a response of humility and faith. But it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I can guarantee you that if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the sufferings that you will face in this life will be far worse going at them alone. It is very simple to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible is very clear on how that is done. It says if you admit that Jesus is Lord, that he is boss with your mouth, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, promises you will be rescued. You will be rescued from your sin. You will be rescued from yourself. And you will enter into the glorious family of God. All it takes is belief and trust. You say, how do I do that? You just talk to God like you do anybody else. The Bible says, say, Allah, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that he has been risen from the dead. Do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? If you do, are you growing? Have your words and your attitude and your thoughts reflected Jesus and Jesus alone in the past week? Can we all say no? There have been times in every single one of our lives that that was not true this week, right? Maybe you're in the middle of a storm. Maybe you're in the middle of suffering. And you just simply need someone to you. Many of you said, yes, I do. I need someone to encourage me. As we sing here in a moment, 
I'm going to ask those to come forward that would like to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that need to spend some time repenting of their sins, or that simply need someone to encourage them. And my challenge to you, those of you who are mature in Christ, when you see someone come forward, you don't know what's going on down here with them. But you, you should be coming down and putting your arm around them. It is a lonely place to kneel at the front. And those of you who have been here and have been encouraged know the joy and the strength that comes when someone puts their arm around you. They don't have to say anything. You may ask them to pray. You may ask them a question. You may not say anything. Maybe you just need somebody to be there. That's encouraging too. As God moves you, by coming this morning, you are simply saying these words. If you don't want to say anything to anybody, this is what you are saying by your movement. I desire to live even and especially in times of suffering, a life fully committed to Jesus. You come as I pray. Our God and our Father. Suffering is not an easy topic, and yet it is the main topic of Scripture because at Calvary, the sufferings of Jesus brought our salvation. And so, Father, we need encouraged today. We need lifted up. We need your arms of comfort around us. And some of us need someone else to give us comfort as well. Let us, as a church and as individuals, be sensitive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. While at the same time, extending, extend the arms, the hands, and the feet of Jesus to it's in the awesome name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Stand with me as we sing. And as God moves you, you come.